Hi, welcome to Exploring the World Ocean. I'm Sean Chamberlain. In today's lecture, I'd like to talk about the theory of plate tectonics, the idea that Earth's crust is divided into several large pieces that move relative to each other. The theory of plate tectonics has a long and colorful history in the annals of science, and it serves as one of the best examples of the scientific method in action. The theory of plate tectonics explains many of the features that we see on Earth, and especially many of the features that we see along the seafloor. So it's an important foundation for understanding the kinds of things we're going to talk about throughout the semester. Let's explore this theory now. One of the first things we need to know is, what is plate tectonics? How does it work? This idea that the continents move about the face of our planet is kind of a hard one to grasp. So let's talk a little bit about what it is and how it happens on our planet. How does plate tectonics account for the features that we see on Earth? In particular, how does it explain the mountains and valleys and all the things we see on land, as well as the mountains and trenches and all the things that we see on the seafloor as well? And finally, what kind of evidence supports plate tectonics? How do scientists know that plate tectonics really is going on on our planet. Well, technically, plate tectonics, or the theory itself, refers to the origins, history, and movements of the dozen or so large and rigid tectonic plates of Earth's lithosphere, or really just Earth's crust. It's the idea that Earth's crust is divided into a dozen or so large jigsaw puzzle-like pieces that move about on the face of our Earth. That, in its simplest form, is the theory of plate tectonics. Earth's lithosphere actually includes the crust and part of the upper portion of the mantle. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, even though we mentioned it briefly in Chapter 2. Plate tectonics accounts for earthquakes, mountain ranges, oceanic ridges, volcanoes, submarine trenches, climate change, evolution, and a whole lot more. So when they talk about plate tectonics being a theory of the Earth and unifying many different geological and even Earth processes, it's really true. Plate tectonics explains a lot. Well, here's a figure from the book, figure 3-7, and it shows you all the different plates, or at least the major plates, that are found on Earth's surface. We live on the North American plate, right next to the Pacific plate, which happens to be the largest tectonic plate of all. But as you can see, there are about 12 to 14, depending on who's doing the counting, different plates with different names. And all the plates include both parts of the continents and parts of the ocean basins. And that's an important thing to remember, as we'll see in just a few minutes. The idea is that these plates move, but they don't move about sort of like ice cubes in a glass. They move in a way that takes a little bit of thinking to get used to. Plates originate, or they form, at oceanic ridges. And we'll learn a little bit more about this as we go along. Oceanic ridges are essentially mountains, and it's here that new seafloor is formed in a process called seafloor spreading. When that new seafloor forms, it in some sense, though not actually, pushes the plates outwards. And if we have something being created, we have to have something being destroyed or that our planet would continue to balloon up, which we know that it doesn't. And so that crust is also taken away and melted in what are called subduction zones. Now this figure from the book, figure 3-4, has a lot of information in it, and we'll be coming back to this, but just for sort of an overview of where we're going, it's a good picture to take a look at right now. Back in Chapter 2, we introduced the parts of the interior of the Earth. We're going to take a closer look at that now. You may recall that Earth has a crust and a mantle and a core, and that's what unites it with the other rocky planets that we talked about in Chapter 2. Well, we want to make an important distinction here between those what are called chemical layers, the crust, mantle, and core being designations for the chemical composition of those layers, and what we call mechanical layers, layers that are based on their strength, their ability to move. The mechanical layers are the important ones in the theory of plate tectonics. Well, here's a cutaway of the Earth. 
again, much like a Tootsie Pop or an egg, if you prefer, maybe even a baseball. And if we look at the kinds of things that we looked at in Chapter 2, here we see the core. Remember, it's made out of iron. That's really what, again, unifies the rocky planets. We have a mantle, and this is made of sil silicate-type material. Again, the kinds of things you find in beach sand. And a little bit lighter silicates are what make up the crust of the Earth. Now, one distinction I'm going to make in just a few minutes is that Earth has two types of crust, just sort of like your local pizza parlor. It has oceanic crust, as you might expect, we find oceanic crust in the ocean, and continental crust. And the continental crust is really what we live on most of the time. We're on continental crust. In fact, it would be rare indeed if you'd ever stood on oceanic crust. The only way to do that is when oceanic crust has been pushed up onto the continents by some tectonic process. But here we have the three layers, the crust, and the mantle and the core. On the basis of their strengths, of their physical properties, we define something called the lithosphere, the asthenosphere, and what's called the mesosphere. Now the lithosphere is the important part insofar as plate tectonics go. And as you can see, it includes part of the crust and a little bit of the upper mantle. And this crust and mantle are the parts that move about the face of our planet. They make up the lithospheric plates. The lith lithosphere rides on the asthenosphere. And I realize you need to practice these words a little bit. By practice saying them, it'll be a lot easier to remember them come test time. So asthenosphere, asthenosphere. Say it to yourself several times. The lithosphere, the plates, sort of glide upon, if you want to use that word, the asthenosphere. This is the more fluid part. This is the rigid part. This is the fluid part. So really, in some sense, the asthenosphere is the lubricant over which the plates glide or the lith lithosphere glides. These are the kinds of terms that we're going to use in describing plate tectonics. And really, the lithosphere is really the only important one to remember. The details aren't so important unless you're in a geology class. but so that you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the lithospheric plates, that it's more than just the crust, it's a crust and a piece of the upper mantle, then if you can remember that, you'll be in great shape. Okay, so as I said before, Earth's crust is actually divided into two types of crust. We have the oceanic crust, and oceanic crust is made up largely of a mineral called basalt, or a mineral group called basalt. So that's the kind of thing when you go to Hawaii and you're walking on the black sand beaches, you're seeing broken up basalt. It's a, a dense, iron-rich kind of material, and it sort of forms the floor of the ocean basins, or the, the, it's the cup that makes up the ocean basins that we're familiar with. Continental crust, on the other hand, is sort of light, if you want to think about getting hit in the head with a piece of granite as being light, but relative to the oceanic crust, the oceanic, the continental crust kind of floats up, a lot like an ice cube in a glass. That continental crust is made up largely of granites and granite-type kinds of rocks. So when you go up on our local mountains, that's what you see. Continental crust, granites and granite-like rocks, and some of you may even have granite countertops. So that kind of mineral group should be familiar to you, or that kind of rock group, I should say, more specifically.